Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Plagamar. I'm with a thing called the National Cybersecurity Alliance. I'm the executive director. Who's heard of the National Cybersecurity Alliance? Anybody? Few people. Oh, this is better than normal. This is great. Uh, normal when I ask security practitioners. Um, who's heard of Cybersecurity Awareness Month? I'm so glad it's over. You guys are my uh, closing party. Um, I'm exhausted. I personally have probably done 60 or 70 talks this month. Our team has been running game shows for organizations all over the globe. I even spoke to Royal Mail last week. So we are the founders of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We've been doing it for 20 years. This year we celebrated the, the 20th. Um, we've been CISA grantees, or before that DHS grantees, for 20 years. So that's our biggest claim to fame is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. After that is Data Privacy Week in January. Um, Cybersecure My Business is a small business education series, and then we have an HBCU career program. I like to say we're kind of the training and awareness manager for the country, um, but we really focus on end user education. And um, the other thing I like to say is we're talking to my kids and my mom. Those are the age groups that our research tells us are the hardest <laughs> to work with. So Jen, Gen Zs, and then our aging population. So if you're like me, and you've got folks on both ends of the spectrum that you're trying to help with technology, um, we've got a bunch of content on staysafeonline.org that can help you. And everything we put out there is free. Free, 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 free. Whoops. Um, can you go back one more? Sorry about that. Or can I go back? I can go back. So if you work for one of these companies, thank you very much. You're on our board. Um, we couldn't support. Uh, we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't fulfill our mission without their support. So we're very grateful for those folks. Now, um, my slides are not lining up with my notes. Does that make sense? There we go. OK. So when Grant asked me to do the closing keynote, I said, you don't want me. I've never written a line of code in my life. I wouldn't know cross-site scripting if it hit me in the face. The closest I've come to anything AppSec related is when I was running a training and awareness program, my CISO said, hey, you got to spin up an OWASP top 10 training program and then get with the heads of engineering and make them say yes to it and have 1,900 engineers get trained. Um, so I've, I've worked alongside developers for a long time, always in like product management and marketing, things like that, product marketing. But I don't, I, my AppSec knowledge is minimal. And he said, well, I just, I just need you to talk about something inspiring. It's the closing keynote. I'm like, okay, well, I think I can do that. So I finally got to develop an idea that I've had for a couple of years. Um, and it's around this, this concept of how the, the uh, value of hindsight being 2020 and the stupid things that we do as humans that can cause disruption to society and loss of life. And years later, we look back uh, with our, our pride and our hindsight and say, boy, they were really dumb back then. Why did they do this this way? Um, there are plenty of examples from the Victorian age when things were changing really, really rapidly with industrialization. Um, it brought massive, massive changes in the way people lived and the way people worked. The home became a place of respite, um, usually uh, cared for by the wife, creating a sanctuary at home um, for the for the whole family and for her husband when he would come home from a day at the office or a day at the factory instead of just a, a day out in the field on the farm. And home decor wasn't just for the wealthy anymore, not just for the leisure class. People started inviting color into their lives. Wallpaper, rugs, plush furniture, it was all the rage in the Victorian age. And a lot of it was available in this new, very vibrant color green um, that was very popular. You were bringing the serenity of nature into your home, away from the hustle and bustle of the factory or the office and the, and the industrial world. So this green was created by a Swedish chemist named Carl Wilhelm Scheele. This green pigment was uh, created by him in 1775. But a strange thing happened. People started getting sick and eventually dying, dropping dead, until someone realized that they were only feeling ill at home. Something in the home must be to blame. It was not until the late 1860s that doctors connected the, the deaths and the illnesses to this luminous green wallpaper that was on people's walls. 
because Shayla created that, that green with arsenic. <laughs> And the manufacturer of the green wallpaper, uh, one of the foremost designers in England at the time, decided this was a hoax created by doctors. He didn't believe it. He didn't believe that arsenic was poisonous, that it was toxic, that it could kill you. So in the 1870s, he finally bowed to public pressure and started producing arsenic-free wallpaper. By the 1890s, the last brand of uh, wallpaper that had arsenic in it ceased production. So invented in 1775, the color, didn't stop using it until the 1890s. So we look back smugly now from our 2023 modern lives and say, how stupid was that? They were killing themselves with their wallpaper. It took over 115 years for them to stop putting arsenic on the walls. Something seems so obviously, hideously stupid did not seem so obvious in the moment. Hindsight is 2020. So I have a theory that we're still very much in the infancy of the information age. Technology that literally lives depend on is immature and fragile. There are many examples of the painful process of ushering in new life-changing inventions and trends that become major changes in the way we live, but that start out so fraught with peril and errors and even loss of human life. So instead of deadly wallpaper, I have another parallel for you that might be even more relevant for us today. It's near and dear to my heart because I'm a Rust Belt kid. So that parallel is the auto industry and the evolution of automotive safety. So my first ever uh, OWASP meeting in Austin, the chapter meeting, when I realized I was gonna have to train 1,900 developers, I thought I'd better go to an OWASP meeting and figure out what all this stuff is about, right? Um, so, so there was a speaker from Sonatype that day, and he quoted Deming. And I've been, worked in the auto industry a large portion of my life, grew up in it, and so as soon as he started quoting Deming, I thought, these are my people, this I can understand. And the quote was, um, a comparison to we, I can't test quality into your product, right? We can't test security into developer's code. So it made complete sense, and that's when I've been thinking about this parallel ever since. So this is the idea I was excited to research and bring to you today. So as I said, I grew up in the Rust Belt. I worked for uh, Ford my first 10 years out of college in marketing and sales. My father was an engineer for over 30 years for General Motors his entire career. Um, and in fact, we used to joke as a family that we had the entire supply chain in our family. My uncle was the comptroller of an iron ore mine in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So he would mine the ore and ship the pellets down the Great Lakes to Cleveland, where my grandfather would make it into uh, uh, double-sided galvanized steel, uh, Republic Steel in Cleveland. And then that would get shipped to a place like Lordstown, Ohio, where my father worked for General Motors, and it would get made into Chevy Vegas. And yes, I watched a Chevy Vega being made when I was a little kid on a Cushman cart. My dad dro drove me through the factory to watch our car being made. So I remember being a kid in the 80s when dad came home from work one night, and the dinner table conversation was all about how pointless airbags were because they only were effective in head-on collisions, and that was such a small percentage of collisions. I don't understand why we're wasting our time doing this. It's just competitive market pressure. This doesn't make any sense. Sound a little stupid today? I've never had, my dad is still living. I haven't had this conversation with him. But to him, it seemed like a waste of time at the time. So there's a, a lot of numbers on here, and I've got a lot of notes. Let's look at the evolution of automotive safety and see if any of these things ring true, if any of this sounds a little bit familiar, some of these attitudes. In the late 1800s, the predecessor to the modern motor car is invented, and we promptly have the first automotive fatality in 1869. In 1901, Mercedes invents the, f the first uh, modern mo motor car, and in 1908, Ford introduces the Model T, and William Durant founds General Motors. We have mass production, cars for everyone. In 1921, the Federal Highway Act makes it easier to drive more and faster, but we haven't legislated or regulated any safety yet at all. 
So does this sound familiar? We don't want to slow down innovation. We want to go, we want to go faster and longer and do more. And hydraulic brakes, thankfully, uh, come on the scene about a year later. Also in the 20s, we see the introduction of planned obsolescence and manufacturers leaning into styling and new features. A new emphasis on styling exemplified in the largely cosmetic model year change. We don't, do, we don't make a big deal out of those anymore. We cared more about what vehicles look like than about how safe they were and what features they had. Feature, 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 sound familiar? All more important than, our, than the human lives we were putting in these vehicles. In 1930, we get safety glass. I can only imagine how gruesome accidents were before safety glass. In 1949, the vehicle manufacturer Nash starts offering seat belts as optional. Guess what? Nobody buys them. Customers actually ask dealers to remove them from cars or they cut them out of the vehicles themselves. In 1955, the modern three-point seatbelt is invented. Only 2% of Ford buyers order seatbelts in their cars. In 1958, manufacturers stopped charging for them. Guess what? Safety didn't even sell. People didn't want to pay for it. Does security sell? Sometimes, not always. Seatbelts, it'll eventually be, by, be determined by the CDC, cut automotive deaths in half. In 1952, the airbag is invented. It takes another 30 plus years before we start seeing them in any meaningful way in mass production. In late 1955, retractable seat belts, recessed steering wheels, reinforced roofs, roll bars, automatic door locks, and passive restraints like airbags were all proposed by safety engineers back in 1955. It takes decades to see their widespread use in the industry. In the 1960s, automotive is, from what I could determine in my research, the first industry to get serious about a bill of materials. Another very familiar concept that's been talked about here so far this week. In 1962, General Motors testifies to the New York State Legislature that people were better off being thrown from their cars in an accident than wearing a seatbelt. Now, if that was uh, a lap belt at a high speed, that's probably true. Henry Ford II says all this safety stuff is going to put us out of business. Did your business say that? You're going to slow us down so much, you're going to ruin the app. Like, by 1966, motor vehicle traffic crashes nationally claim 51,000 lives a year, or 26 deaths for every 100,000 Americans. That's a very high number. American cars are averaging 24 defects per unit, many of them safety related. In 1966, the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act creates what's now known as NHTSA. What causes this? What happens right before 1966? It's Ralph Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed, which lambasted the industry for their lack of safety engineering. Somewhere in the 60s and 70s, we get crash tests, head-on at first and then offset. It takes us until 2003, believe it or not, to start meaningful side impact crash tests by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Did we not start T-boning each other until 2003? Why did that take so long? This one really stunned me, even a kid from Detroit. How many people died in side impact crashes before that point? That was amazing to me when I, when I found that out. In the 1980s, when I was coming of age and interning at, at General Motors, yeah, I'm that old, um, the auto industry goes through a massive, massive transformation, huge bloodletting, mainly around quality and reliability, precipitated by the huge influx of what? Japanese cars, Japanese imports. The transformation takes five years, and the industry collectively spends $80 billion on this effort, retooling, plant modernization, all those things. Are we waiting for that day to happen in tech? Do you ever wake up some days and say, we just need to start all over again? You know, the internet was never <laughs> built to be secure, and we're trying to back our way into this, and it just feels like, sometimes like a thank thankless task. In 2015, at the very end there, NHTSA endorses seatbelts on buses. 2015, 
The first patent for the earliest basic seat belt, not the three point, but the, the first one, was in 1889. It takes us humans 126 years to get f from that, from that concept to thinking about protecting our children that we put in school buses every day. So what does it look like for tech? I just took a stab at this. What, it, what have we done so far? Where are we if we were gonna have some sort of comparison on where we are on this path? And I would argue that we're, it's very, very early days. We're not even 100 years into this. The first software vulnerability, and I'm not going back to the beginning of computers, that's a whole other conversation, but the first software vulnerability is discovered at MIT in 1965. Um, then we have the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, ARPANET, the foundation for the modern day internet. The first virus then was in 1971, the Creeper program, designed as a security test to see if a self-replicating program was possible. How'd that go? <laughs> I think it is. The creeper spread over ARPANET and left the following message on machines. I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. If it was all only still that innocent, can you imagine? Nobody stealing data, nobody stealing money. It's probably debatable when the first major malware outbreak occurred, but likely it was the, something called the Morris Worm in 1988. I'll quote here, Robert Morris had an idea to try to gauge the size of the internet by writing a program that would propagate across computer networks um, and exploit a known Unix bug and copy itself. However, due to human error, the Morris worm began to replicate itself so aggressively that control of it was lost and it began to take over. This sounds like the conversations we're having now about AI. Are we gonna lose control of the technology? We're, we're 25 years later and we're, we're still worried about this. It's early days still, we haven't figured it all out. As Alyssa said yesterday, JavaScript was released by Netscape in 1995. 1998, we see the first SQL injection. Cross-site scripting in 2000. And as Alyssa said yesterday, we're still seeing way too much of both of these, right? And then OWASP was founded in 2001. Somewhere around 2004, 2005, we finally start thinking about security in a more serious way, and that's when we have the first big standard PCI DSS for the payment card industry. But it wasn't until um, 2005 that application security itself became more mainstream amongst engineering and development communities and security communities um, with a worm that hit MySpace. Over a million MySpace users were infected and MySpace was taken offline. Can't say that I miss it, but. So I could keep going with more recent history, but it's all stuff that's happened uh, in everybody's lifetime that's in, in the room, right? We've had multiple executive orders. We got a new one this week. Um, all the, I didn't even bother to see like, when was the first static test run? When was the first dynamic test? Pen testing, how did that start? When did that start? But it's all been in recent, um, recent years. Um, we've got consumer labeling pending, um, GDPR, CCPA, national strategy from the ONCD, all very recent, hopefully known to most of you. But my point is, though, that we still have a really, really, really long way to go. It's very early days in the information age, and I don't want you to be discouraged. So persevere. I hope the last two days have inspired you to keep going. I've, I hope you've exchanged ideas with industry colleagues and that gives you the energy to persevere. The other thing I think we need is some advocacy. That's why, uh, that's why I included Ralph Nader. Where's our Ralph Nader? Who will this be in our lifetime? There are so many voices clamoring within the security community about all the issues we face. Who will be the voice or the voices that break through to the business, that break through to the consumer public? to say that we demand better of the technology that we use in our lives. Consumer awareness, maybe this is the result of that advocacy. I think we need more of this. This is kind of the business that I'm in. What's the bumper sticker? If you're not appalled, you're not paying attention, you haven't been paying attention. Speaking of paying attention, we're working on a new campaign to get some attention. 
I feel like this might get some attention. It was based on the recent headlines. I kind of woke up at four in the morning after the story broke and had this idea. Um, so maybe this might get the attention. Because I, I, I was standing in line for a flight a couple weeks ago, and a woman next to me was a C-level executive at a US company that was owned by a Swiss company. And she was kind of joking about having had a ransomware attack. And oh, yeah, we paid. And she kind of laughed it off. And I'm really getting tired of everybody laughing it off. So. Um, so we've got some campaigns that use fear. We've got some ca campaigns that use humor. I'm going to share one of those with you at the end. But there's definitely a role for consumer awareness here. Regulation, there's a role for government here, too. Um, the executive orders, the national strategy and the plan, everything coming out of ONCD has helped. They've made it really clear what the expectations are. If you want to be in the DOD supply chain, that's for sure. The new SEC regulations will help shine a light on things. And I think sunlight and transparency are great healers for problems. But regulation can only do so much. It's a part of the answer. Um, I'm not an SBOM expert by any means, but I hear a lot of conversations on whether or not that's actually working. Right? Everybody's very excited when it was in the executive order, but is it doing everything we hoped? Is it not really? Is it going to turn into a tick box exercise? What's happening? So raising the level of visibility and discourse through these things, I think, is, is useful. We all agree that something needs to happen, but it's really hard for us to agree on what, including the folks on Capitol Hill, especially the folks on Capitol Hill. The issues are so complex, and we're not sure what's really going to be a fix and what will have unintended consequences. So you can't pull one lever and just expect it to, to affect one outcome. These are complex problems, and they have complex solutions, but I think regulation is one of the levers. Alignment and unification. This is something we have to work on as a, as a community. Um, Coming together as experts in the field on, on agreeing on what it is we want through organizations like OWASP, where we want to things, see things go. We need to band together to work toward common goals and be unified as a community. This is something else that can be really hard, but if we sound like disparate voices, we'll fail to amplify the problem. We won't get share of mind. So we all need to be singing in, in unison. We can't just say we want development to slow down so we can catch up. Um, I think we've heard plenty in the last two days about not being the department of no. We know that that doesn't work. We can't clamor for a multitude of disparate solutions, some that may be potentially conflict with each other. And we can't be unreasonable. We heard, I heard one of the keynote, I can't remember whose keynote it was, if it was yours, about the, the security people can be a little unreasonable sometimes. Some progress is better than no progress. A great problem of contemporary life is how to control the power of economic interests which ignore the harmful effects of their technology. We are fighting a problem that's as old as modern commerce itself. So let's talk a little bit about Ralph Nader. I have some inspirational characters here, and these are in no particular order. They're not in a chronological order or anything. So he wrote the book, Unsafe at Any Speed, which, as I said, lambasted the industry for their lack of safety standard. Um, the book resulted in the creation of the Department of Transportation in 1966, and then uh, predecessor agencies that eventually turned into NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, in 1970. Is the next Ralph Nader in this room? Is he here this week, or she? Lawrence Patrick. This gentleman, and these are all men. They're all white men, every single one of them. It was a long time ago. Um, he was a professor at Wayne State University in Detroit. This blew my mind. He's, he's one of the fathers of the modern crash test dummy. Between 1960 and 1975, I quote, he says, I was a human crash test dummy. I allowed myself to be subject to over 400 rocket sled rides crushing blows to the head and body, other forms of physical abuse, in order to, to develop a body of data on the human body and how it responded in a vehicle accident. He also suggested himself to a 50-pound pendulum to the breastplate to test the effects of a steering column on a human. One of his students went on to develop what is now currently the worldwide standard for crash test dummies. Are you the next Lawrence Patrick? Please don't hurt yourself. <laughs> 
Bella, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce his last name. He was the father of passive automotive safety design. So he believed that things like steering columns and the steering wheels, suspension, car body design should all be changed to enhance the safety of the car's occupants. He holds over 2,000 patents. That's twice as many as Thomas Edison. He developed the concept of the crumple zone. We all drive cars today that use that concept. Where you've just engineered the car to design, uh, design it to uh, absorb the energy of an impact during a collision. Mr. Bolin, he is credited with the invention of the modern three-point safety belt. We all still use these today. He worked at Volvo, and this is now a standard feature that we all take for granted. Hugh de Haven. After surviving a plane crash in the First World War, he became the father of crash survivability. And then he survived a traffic accident, which, which just served to increase his, his passion and his interest in safety. I'll quote him. We will get into anybody's automobile, go any desired distance at dangerous speeds without safety belts, without shoulder harnesses, and with a very minimum of padding or other protect protection to prevent our heads and bodies from smashing against the inside of a car in an accident. The level of safety which we accept for ourselves, our wives, and our children is there and now for on a par with shipping fragile, valuable objects loose inside a container. He claimed that people knew more about how to ship eggs safely than how to transport humans in a, in a vehicle. Eddie Rickenbacker, known for a, a lot of things, but he pioneered putting four-wheel brakes on a production car. Before that, cars only had rear wheel. Other auto companies waged a smear campaign against this move. They said it was dangerous that it would result in too many rear-end collisions if you could stop too quickly. <laughs> Stunning. Um, and finally, Claire Straith. Uh, one of the things I came to know during the research for this presentation was that plastic surgery was invented in Detroit by Dr. Straith. He started working um, on people that had sustained injuries during the First World War. He was a pioneer of safety and described cranial and facial injuries created by dashboards before they were padded, like the dashboards we have now, and windshields. And he advocated for padding dashboards and using safety belts and all those things. He was the first to recognize that it was automobiles that injured people. An accident was just the event, but it was the collision between the, the vehicles and between the passengers inside of the car that caused injuries. Nobody had thought about it that way before. So who's going to be the Claire Straith of APSEC? Are you in this room? So this was the result of all that engineering and all that advocacy. And there's a lot of lines on the page. But the, the most important one is the red one that you see. That's uh, deaths per billion vehicle miles traveled. So as as uh, populations increased and people started driving more, that red line that just goes straight down um, is the most accurate measure taking into account the increase in population, the increase of time that people are spending behind the wheel. So all the advocacy, all the regulation, the research, the smart people persevering to solve the problem made huge progress. Imagine a day when we can look back and see charts that show our criticals and highs plummeting like that red line. I would love to see that. I'd also love to see a massive downturn in global cybercrime, the abuse of all technology, because we finally figured it out. So I'm going to leave you today with um, a little something entertaining. Uh, this is a new series that we have just brought out. It's a web series. I checked earlier today. In the first week, we had a million views. We're under two weeks now, and we're at two million views. We're putting paid advertising behind this um, to try and get the attention of people who don't care, the people who aren't paying attention, people like my kids. And I'm going to show you a, uh, the URLs at the top, but I'm going to show you a little teaser. We hammer, 
We use brute force. We let AI figure it out while we hang on on TikTok looking for soccer. You understand, right? This is essentially organized crime. You lie and lie until you die. Spam some fools. The noise gives me, you know, like a pep in my step. Oh, yeah, hey, please. Yeah. my favorite part, you know, doing the stealing and taking the money. I love that. Vogue wants simple scam for simple-minded people. We work for one of the biggest cyber criminals in the world. A guy who keeps polonium in his cupboard. And you want to talk about snacks. So we had a lot of fun with this. This is a web series. The episodes are short and funny. It's basically it's like you're watching The Office or Office or Mythic Quest or any of those shows, but you're looking, of course, at the criminals. So it is not meant for your corporate training and awareness programs. It is not politically correct. It is a little spicy here and there. So the characters are from China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Um, we had a lot of fun with this, and, and so far we're getting some really good views, and a lot of people are watching the videos to completion, which is another good metric to have. Um, any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. I think, so we have a program where we work with HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, and um, we have a lot of sponsors for that program, like um, Amazon and Trellix and Proofpoint and Dell. And, and so we, we try to foster communication between the recruiters and the security executives at those sponsoring companies and the faculty at the universities. But I think, the, so the biggest disconnect that I hear most frequently is that the professors want to do research on things that really aren't useful for the hiring, the employers that are hiring. So we do, that is a huge, huge disconnect right now is that the curriculum doesn't really align. I mean, some schools are better than others, obviously, but that's a, that's a huge gap, yeah. Oh, her question was, what was your, how did you phrase it? <laughs> About um, what role does education play, meaning academia? Um, and not, produ not producing crappy software. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, secure coding should be mandatory for anybody getting a degree in computer science. Like, if you're, if you're gonna go be a developer, then this has to be part of it. And I think, I mean, I don't know, do we all feel that way, that eventually this is gonna be integrated into every developer's job? I mean, I think we wanna put ourselves out of business, right? Like, 50 years from now, we shouldn't exist. 20 years from now. Um, I think that's, that's, it should be seen as just another quality issue, right? It's, it's just another, another code bug. Anybody else? Questions for him, for the guy in the kilt? <laughs> Shout, because I can't see you. Can I have a oh, there's one. I'll come back to you. I think, uh, there's also a psychology issue going on here. Uh, it's not just a quality issue, and that seems to be the most difficult thing to overcome. Do you have any comments on that? What do you think the psychology issue is? People who've been in their jobs a long time, and this is status quo, and mm -hmm. you know, we, we've never had a problem in X years. Why are we doing yeah, this? Yeah, the arsenic was, uh, was not a problem. It was just a hoax. And Henry Ford II saying, we'll go out of business if we have to do all these things. I mean, people are resistant to change. Change is hard. And what we're trying to do is, is change an industry that, that frankly, a, a doesn't want to be changed in a lot of ways. Um, they're too busy running fast and breaking things still. And I, I, I really wish we could kill that phrase. Okay, so since no one else asked a question, like, you just get to hear Tanya's questions. <laughs> How can we as an industry pressure academia? I know I'm going on and on, but like I went, to, I went to college in the 90s. There was no security. But I talk to people now and there's still no security. And there's I wrote no a book about AppSec. Yep. And universities are like, yes, you can come and teach it. We'll pay you less than a Walmart greeter. So then I yep. say, no, thank you. And I teach for free instead. But how do we, how do we force this issue? Like electricians go to school and if, if like, 
um, houses just burnt down all the time, that wouldn't work, right? But for some reason, it's totally cool we burn down houses. So I think it's a state-by-state state, um, issue. So I see, like, we're, we've talked to the folks at Cyber Florida. So the state of Florida made a huge commitment. And they're, they're um, injecting security into K through 12 and into universities. They are sending high school teachers um, to get degrees in security over the summer. Now they have a problem where they then lose those teachers to go be security professionals because they can like quadruple their salary. But, um, but they're approaching it from a bunch of different angles. They've made a, that, that commitment as a state and they've put budget and people on the problem. Um, and it's, 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 it's working. I mean, it's really early days yet. Um, North Dakota has mandated security as part of K-12 education. And I think New York is either done it or is working on it. So I think it starts really with K-12. And then, um, and then I think the universities will start to wake up more. When, the, when, the, when your high school junior is looking around at uh, you know, college programs and deciding where they want to study, um, and they're really interested in cybersecurity, they're gonna gravitate th toward the schools that are doing a really good job. Um, there are also more community colleges. St. Philip's College in San Antonio is doing a great job, and um, Dade, Miami Dade, the community college there. You don't need a four-year degree, right? So more and more schools with two-year programs on, in cybersecurity. I've, I've been surprised that they haven't been faster to ramp up, though, because, because of the job gap, the workforce gap, yeah. Um, so, um, next question, Tanya. I would like her to sing her question. <laughs> um, anyway, kidding aside, um, my, my feeling is this, um, and I don't want to sound too cynical, but it seems to me businesses will cut costs at all costs. Yep. And you know, consumers, uh, well, we kind of do the same thing. We want to buy the cheapest mm -hmm. thing, right? I mean, we buy the cheapest food. We didn't even uh, want to pay for seatbelts. Uh, yeah, so um, unless the, I feel like if the government intervenes somehow to, um, you know, to pass the laws to force a certain things until the consumer get educated a few generations later. I think it's really tempting to want the silver if, bullet. If we want things to happen fast. We want things to happen faster. Do you think any of the men that I showed in that series of slides were optimists? I'm guessing they were pretty frustrated, just like we get frustrated today, right? And, and I made the point about all the different things that I think are necessary to change the problem because I don't think there's any one single answer. It's a really, really complex problem and it's got a complex answer and we have to be okay with that. So I think we're starting to make progress, um, but that's why I say please persevere. <laughs> don't, don't give up because I think we still have a really long road to to travel down, to use a, another car, car metaphor, but um, I, think, I think it's really tempting to think, oh, if government would just do something, if customers just wanted this, if, if, if. It's really all those things happening at, to different degrees and at different levels that, that all sort of push us forward as an industry, I hope. <laughs> Was there something else? Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to touch base on the topic of ransomware. Um, you talked about that on one of your slides. Um, and I think it's, it's like when it comes to a situation where you have to keep your business up and running, your service up and running, and you are in that situation where somebody's holding you hostage, um, the business have to make that call what to do next, and many of them are choosing to pay the ransom. Uh, my question was, is there anything being done, uh, an initiative to make laws against paying? ransom? Um, not that I've seen. I, I, I've read about that. I've heard discussions about it. I'm not so sure that's the, that's the right answer. Um, you're kind of, because if somebody violates that, you're punishing the victim. That's what I don't like about it theoretically. But you're never going to hear me say, I know a lot of people are really pragmatic about ransomware and what to do in the heat of the moment. I'm on the U.S. Secret Service Cyber Investigations Advisory Board. We we're funded, partially funded by CISA. I am never going to say it's okay to pay. I have a really clear moral compass about that. And I think the more we discover about where that money is actually going, the easier it is to have a really clear moral compass. I think organizations need to decide, is this who we are as a company? Do we want to fund the North Korean missile program? I mean... Is this what we stand for as an organization? It's a policy decision that you make 
way in advance of it happening. If you haven't made it yet, then please, please go decide what your policy is going to be. Because as soon as you decide what your policy is going to be, no, we're not going to pay. Well, then, okay, what do we have to do to make sure we're not in that position? Then I'll get funding, I'll get resources, because we made this at a, you know, the board or the C-suite made this policy decision. So I think it's really important to be proactive about it, um, not just from a technical perspective, but also from a leadership perspective. Is there somebody out there? Yep. So I kind of have this one that's piggybacking off of that, but one of the biggest arguments for security is that it saves the company money, but with cyber insurance companies, that's kind of mitigated some of the cost burden for them, and so they don't see it as being much of an issue. Would it be a good practice to put limits on how much cyber insurance is allowed to pay out or anything like that in order to make the company feel like they need to take it more seriously because it could be more detrimental to their overall health? I think, um, I think the free market is doing a pretty good job of kind of regulating itself, right? I'm hearing more and more about policies that have a lot of exceptions. In other words, if your basic IT and cyber hygiene is so lacking that you know you were this was inevitable <laughs> then um then your policy isn't going to magically you know there's no get out of jail free card there i think like there was when cyber insurance was brand new um but i mean i don't know it's not a problem i thought about because like frankly i can't see it happening i can't see any regulating body get getting that into the weeds with the issue that they would feel comfortable um I mean, I, I did a fireside chat with Director Easterly uh, last October during one of our events, and she said very plainly that there's not a lot of appetite for much regulation. So I, I don't know that we're going to get much more than what we've gotten out of the, um, the executive orders and everything so far. So I think I see, again, I think at the state level, there's more opportunity to do more, and then eventually that might force some federal action because we'll have too many conflicting state laws and it'll be a mess. Kind of the way we're going with C CCPA and everything now. You should just come back up here. <laughs> oh, okay, so last question from me. How can our community support the efforts that your organization is doing? I've been thinking about that yesterday and today while I've been here. How do, how do we, because we're in the business of trying to raise awareness about cybersecurity across the board. So how do we raise awareness about application security? And um, I don't know what the answer is to that question, right? It's, it's really easy to talk to consumers about watching out for scams and phishing emails and all those things. And it's even reasonable to talk to small and medium-sized businesses about ransomware and what they need to do to be prepared and all those kinds of things. Um, I think it's a harder conversation with even some of our board member companies that are, that are big tech. Um, because I, I know just from my 12 or 13 years I spent at a technology company, you know, we, we were a security team of 30 people trying to get a $2 billion organization to, you know, to, to take the vulnerability management program seriously. Um, so I know it's, it's something that everybody battles with. Uh, I think it's gonna come down more to that, I think that consumer element of just like, getting fed up with the way technology functions. There's a lot of, so we've documented um, apathy on the part of like Gen Z particularly. These are the, this is like the folks born in the late 90s and the early 2000s who grew up with data breaches in the headlines. They're the least likely to try to think that doing anything about their personal security or privacy is worthwhile. They're also the most compromised. So they're the most likely to click on something and get defrauded, have either data or money stolen. Um, I think 43% of them, if I remember the number right, have had losses of data or money due to uh, phishing, believe it or not. Um, they also believe, though, that they're the ones that the older generations are relying on for information. So we're taking the, the generation that is arguably has the worst personal practices when it comes to their security and their privacy, and, and they're helping um, the aging members of their families. Um, I think there's got to be a point where the younger generations are kind of up to here. Um, you know, I don't miss standing on the side of the road with a broken vehicle. I don't miss, you know, my dad driving me to school in a Chevette. Like, <laughs> things got better. We demanded better. Competition helped, right? The Japanese and then the Koreans. And 
Um, so I, I think, I'm hoping that market forces eventually will get us there and that consumers will start to demand better. Everybody can, re I'm guessing everybody in this room can remember the day when people just told you to turn your computer off and turn it back on again, right? Like that was the fix for everything. And we've come a long way since that. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll get there.